Hey, it's Mike, and in this interview, I talk with Mark Ripito, who really doesn't need any introduction. Uh, if you are familiar with the, the fitness world at all, you know who Mark is. He's the author of several best-selling books. Uh, the most well-known and you know, the most popular book is Starting Strength, uh, which is a program that it's – a, it's a barbell program that, I mean, the I don't know, probably 50 to – 70% of the people that I speak with uh, that read my book and, and, and get into my work have also read Starting Strength, and most of them have also you know ran the program. It's a great program, especially for beginners, uh, it, for, for building that, that initial foundation of strength and getting the muscle growth going and so forth. And um, Mark is obviously very, very knowledgeable. He's worked with, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of people, uh, including elite athletes, Olympic athletes. So he has a, a a unique insight into not just what it takes to get into shape, but what it takes to really get into uh, kind of the elite uh, level of performance and the in, 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 in getting an elite type of physique. Even though physique is not really his thing, he is uh, more of a strength coach. So, um, but of course, he understands that in terms of physique, really all you're well, really all we're talking about is getting big, getting strong, and then getting lean. He's just that, you know, the whole getting lean and getting shredded thing, he thinks it's kind of funny. Um, not that he doesn't know how it works or how to do it, but he's more focused on how do you get big and how do you get strong. So with that, let's get to the interview. All right, hey, Mark, thanks again for uh, taking some time to talk with me. Anytime, Michael. How's things? You know, busy and, uh, and busy, but I can't complain. Do you get big yet or not? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny i had so much uh, that's not funny i got so much <laughs> flack from people from that last one like, so mike when, when are you gonna when are you gonna gain your 30 pounds right now hey mike why don't you get to be 215 and ripped and then that'll be better you know i i honestly i don't think like i'm 190 right now 189 that's uh, 25 pounds. I know, 25 right. pounds. Let's say your body fat goes up 3%. That still puts you at about, what, 8? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm probably around, ah. se- I'm 7 to 8 right now. 7 to 8 is stupid. It, it looks good, it's though. It's just ridiculous. It, it feels it's good. Just, it's, it's, it's a level of obsession with this, with this body fat thing that's just not psychologically healthy. So I'm... You, I can, you and I'll talk about this off the air. Okay? <laughs> I, I can understand where you're coming from, but you might be surprised with how. I mean, I'm very, uh, I'm very flexible with how I eat, and I and I don't have a bunch of head, uh, you know, whatever stuff. It's just uh, part of, I guess, part of my world to to is to walk the walk, and and a lot of like the, the people that 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 uh, generally are reading my stuff and reading my books and following me are they want to they want to look. A certain way, you know what I mean. They want to be. They want to. They oh, want to be leaner. I understand yeah. aesthetics. Is, yeah, you know. they would. They would sacrifice. So it's a, there's strength. a market for that, and you're in that market. I'm in the other end of the deal. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah. Anyways, that's that's another conversation. <laughs> mm. So uh, so in this interview, what I want to do is I want to talk about um, training for for people that are you know when they start getting into the to the middle aged years because. Uh, I get asked about it a lot, and a lot of guys, you know, especially and, – and girls actually and women in their 40s and, and 50s and beyond are kind of worried that it's almost like too late to get into shape. That, you know, if they didn't right. do it – if they didn't do it when they're in their 20s, that now can they really do anything? And uh, in terms of guys, most guys that have this concern, they think that they can't really build any real muscle to speak of and that their hormones are all messed up now and, you know, they won't be able to get lean and – uh, so you obviously, with all your just years of experience, what, what have you seen in terms of people that, uh, you know, what, what, what can guys and, and what can men and women in, in their middle age years expect? Well, let's, let's first define middle age years. Yeah. Uh, it, in my, it, it's been my experience that, that, um, you have a relatively normal novice training response up and in, in, until you're in your you know, early to mid forties. Okay. Okay. In other words, there's not that much difference. Right. So between a guy, but between a 40 year old guy and a 30 year old guy in terms of how he responds to training and what constitutes too much volume and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. You, you take a guy that's just starting out and he's 40 years old, just put him on a regular program, just like we normally talk about. Right. He can go three days a week. 
he's probably going to have to be a little bit more careful about getting enough sleep. Hmm. But he can handle the three-day-a-week volume. He can handle the normal novice progression, as we describe it in our books, right. without any real uh, alteration in, uh, uh, in, in volume load. Now, as a general blanket rule, here's the deal. The older you get, the more sensitive you become to volume, hmm. to, to, to number of reps right. in a workout. Okay? Uh, and would that also it, then This apply? means that a guy that's, that's, uh, that's 60 years old is probably not going to be able to do three sets of five across three days a week. Hmm. He could go two days a week. Hmm. But so the we're extra volume weekly, is what we find that, that older people are more sensitive to. They just can't recover from all of the reps. So uh, so if we looked at it like on a weekly, or like if we're looking at 15 sets per week on a major muscle group, you would, you know, you've seen that, well, fifteen work sets. Yeah, fifteen work sets. Yeah, excluding ex- that's your fifteen heavy. You know, yeah. you know, heavy Let's sets. Say, for instance, yeah. it's it's, it's going to be more like nine, probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, you get up to where you're sixty years old. We're talking about six work sets a week instead of nine. Mm. Uh, yeah, I've I've seen a lot of uh, uh, a lot of of people go through this process, and what strikes me as being the constant across uh, all masters training. Uh, This is men, women, everybody. Hmm. You have to curtail the volume, which means that the most, which means that a master's lifter can deal with the intensity. And that's, and just to clarify for listening. The weight is fine. That's not the problem. Hmm. The problem is doing a bunch of sets with the heavy weight. Hmm. Uh, I personally, for instance, right now, I'm just trying to stave off death with my training. I squat <laughs> one heavy set of five once every two weeks. Wow. And, and, and you find you're able, you're able to maintain with that. Yeah. Yeah, I can maintain with that. I'll, I'll pull. In fact, I make a little progress every once in a while. I'll, I'll pull heavy once every two weeks. Last night, I pulled, uh, I deadlifted 435 for five, and nice. it was easy. Nice. Okay. But it's going to take me a while to recover from that, which means that if I, you know, I'm going to be more sore than I would have been 20 years ago. Right. I'm, uh, I'm, it's going to affect my other training more than it would have 20 years ago. So I've got to wait a little bit longer but between now and any more lower body work, uh, any squats or, or deadlifts. And I have found that, once, uh, like, I alternate Mondays. Every other Monday will either be heavy squats, heavy pulls. And I don't do any other stuff hmm. in, for, for, for those movements except once a week. And uh, so I'll pull heavy about twice a month. Yeah. I'll squat heavy about twice a month, and that's enough. If I try to go up in volume, and every once in a while I'll forget everything I know, just like most people <laughs> do, and I... And I'll try to go up in volume and add another rock. I can't get away with it. Hmm. Can't get away with it. I'll, even even if it's in a higher rep range. That's right. Hmm. Especially if it's in a higher rep range. Okay. Let me let me re- let me say that again. Especially if it's in a higher rep range. This is my point. Sets of ten for guys my age for masters guys are not a good idea. Hmm. And you Even mean, if you it's only like going, one set, going going somewhere approaching failure, as opposed to like you know taking fifty percent of your one rep max and just kind of you know it's almost like getting well, a warm up. fifty uh, percent of your one rep max is not a yeah, it's not enough. Like if you're that's you know not, that's not enough. Seventy well, it's to not even a set of ten load exactly. Set of ten load be seventy percent of one seventy seventy five percent of one rep max yeah. seventy eight percent of one rep max somewhere in there fifty percent of one rep max a warm up set it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, and that's what but I mean because a lot of people in terms do that, of though, work weights for sets of three, five, ten, you can get away with triples and fives when you're older. Hmm. You can get away with per. Perhaps a couple of triples or three triples across, maybe. Right. But when you get to where you're handling sets of 10, 
it it's going to bother your knees. Mm-hmm. It's going to bother your. It's just going to make you sore. The inflammation doesn't go away as fast. Yeah. And my advice to older guys is to hold it down to sets of five, and try to use as few of sets as you possibly can to get a training effect. Mm-hmm. You'll be less sore. You'll sleep better at night. You won't. You won't tend to accumulate tendonitis. Your life will just be more pleasant as, right. while you're training. If you, but if you overestimate your recovery ability, then you will not have good luck with this. And your recovery ability is best taxed by a bunch of volume. Yep. Don't do 20s. Don't do 10s. Yep. Hold it down to 5s. I mean, I found that stuff rough even when I was in my early 20s doing, you know, trying to do everything twice a week and trying to do all this volume and training training to failure all the time and right volume is training to failure all the time whole bunch of volume five sets of five across that's a young man's deal yeah uh older guys you look you're not gonna have good luck with that in fact what we find is that uh when we put older guys on a linear progression where we come in test them the first day three sets of five across Mm mm-hmm Second workout of the week, go up five pounds. They'll get away with that for, you know, three or four months. They'll go up. They'll yep. get stronger. Yep. But they're going to peter out on that linear progress pattern a lot faster than a younger guy will. And if you try, if you go more than the first month doing three workouts a week instead of two, you're going to get you're going to get burned out. It's just too much to recover from. Right. Especially for an untrained older guy. Yeah. Recovery is trainable, too. Your ability to recover will uh, improve over time. Will improve over time, and that's even true for an older guy. But there reaches a point of diminishing returns on that faster with older guys than there does with younger trainees. Yeah. So you, my advice to older people is to just look, you know, if you waited till you're 58 to start working out, look, you fucked up. <laughs> okay? There are consequences to that. You yeah. cannot make as fast a progress as you could have if you had started doing this when you were 19, 20, 21. Yeah. You have to admit that you're not going to approach your potential as closely as if you had started when you were when you were uh, younger. a kid, yeah. younger, with a better hormonal background to help you with your recovery, all of that stuff is yeah. gone. Yeah. It's all gone. I'm sorry. It's gone. You're not a kid. Yeah. You can't pretend you're a kid. There's a price to be paid if you do. Yeah. And hundreds of reps of anything for an older guy is just, that's just, uh, that's hospitalization. Absolutely. What that means. It's not a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I run into that, uh, I've run into the few, a few guys in their fifties, uh, friends of mine that started with CrossFit, even though I told them not a good idea, especially, I mean, they just got into weightlifting for the first time in their late forties or fifties mm-hmm. and, uh, two in, two in particular, one got hurt and the other one was, he didn't, it wasn't a, a bad injury. He, he was starting, he was having nagging pains. It was, it was approaching injury. And then now he got out of that. And now he's just coming with me in the morning, and, and he's back to just like what you're saying, heavy lifting. He's doing about 9 to 12 sets a week uh, for each major muscle group, um, all just compound movements, and he's, he's doing amazing. I mean, he's, uh, he's turning 50, and he just pulled uh, 315 today. For, you know, and this is a guy who hasn't, hasn't – he never really lifted. He does his first time ever even doing a deadlift maybe four months ago. So mm-hmm. I, I definitely have ex- seen the same thing that you're talking about that – all the high rep stuff. I mean, like I said, even when I was, you know, five, six, seven years ago, I found that taxing. So I can only imagine what it would be like in a fifty-year-old body. Well, you know, there's a there's a time to tax, and that time is when you're in your late, uh, your middle, late novice period. Yeah. Your your intermediate period. See what you can do. Yeah. Push it. I mean, Push wouldn't the you think up. it's yeah? See it's, what you can recover from. Yeah. Tax it. Find your limit. Train yeah. at your limit. Because yeah. when you're that age, you can get away with it. Yeah. 
You know, well, even that's, I that's even, how you build a big, giant, strong guy yeah. is is pushing it to that limit, finding where the limit is, yeah. extending the limit. Yeah. But when you're 58, you know, when you're when you're my age, when you're 60, 65, you, you know, the you, you just have to be realistic about what you've got. Right. And what you've got is a completely different hormonal milieu than you did when you were 22. Hmm. When you were 22. When I was 22, I could jump off of buildings <laughs> for plyometrics, and all it would do is make you stronger. <laughs> but you, it, that's not now. Yeah, That's not now. Older guys, uh, several things change as you get older. Uh, obviously, the hormone situation changes. Right. Your growth hormone which helps you heal up connective tissues and stuff. Your testosterone. Testosterone. And it's not that the levels are down, but the receptors aren't as effectively responding to the presence of testosterone as they were when you were young. Yeah. Uh, you, you start they to could have be down, DNA transcription on... errors accumulate. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just, it, you, you don't build things as, as effectively. And in terms of uh, the effects of accumulated training, you've accumulated injuries. Right. As a result of accumulated injuries, you're in a, you know, you're in a minor level of pain all the time. Mm-hmm. This is the stress. That minor level of pain all the time affects your ability to sleep effectively at night. You don't get good, you don't get to sleep like you used to, you know. And if you if you medicate, the quality of sleep isn't as good. Right. Nutritionally. You're not as good as at absorbing nutrients, most especially protein, mm-hmm. as you get older. That therefore you have to have a higher protein intake in terms of grams of protein a day yep. per pound of body weight, and the protein has to be of a higher quality. Right. You know, you get away with, you know, Hoffman's high protein soy flour when you were a kid. <laughs> you know, yeah. but. As you get older, the protein has to be of a higher quality because you're not absorbing as much of it as you were when you were younger. So all of these things accumulate into the fact that you are not going to be as effective at recovering from training as you're older. And the factor of the, the re- and the, the training variable that, that seems to be the one that is most uh, hard to recover from with age as volume. Right. And, uh, and then I, I find, I mean, I find that even with younger, I, I mean, I email and work with a lot of people and I find even a lot of these young guys that uh, are natural and they're trying programs that are having them do, for instance, um, a, a medium volume, uh, probably like a, I'd say a 12 to 15 set heavy workout for upper body and then 12 to 15 set heavy for lower and then mm. doing that and then alternating in the same week with then something about the same with a bit of a higher rep range. So like eight, mm-hmm. to, eight to 10 rep range, uh, and, they're, and then upper lower, and they're trying to run a program like that, you know, massive weekly volume. I've yet to come across a single natural weightlifter that's been able to do it for any longer than a few months, regardless of age. And they also were in a calorie surplus, like forget about it if you're in a deficit. People I've, I've talked to. Oh, no, that, it's not possible. That Absolutely. were just miserable. They had, they just, they had to stop. And even in a surplus, I've, I've, I remember running into one person that said they were able to do it for about three months in a surplus and, and progress. But and, then, and I mean a big surplus. Yeah. And even at right. the end of that, though, they didn't feel good, and they, had, and they just stopped and, went, and they had to reduce weekly volume. At, at, you know, you cannot run a high-volume program for more than six or eight weeks at a time. It's been my experience. Mm. doesn't matter what you're taking. doesn't matter what you're on. doesn't matter how much you're eating. It just beats the shit out of you yeah, it does. at a certain point the inflammation is going to accumulate faster than the gains are and then you got to quit and that's just the way shit is you yeah. know yeah uh, I, I i don't know anybody that's been able to sustain an extreme training regimen like that for i mean i've, for, co- I've come uh, across guys that are on a lot of drugs that run those kind of programs for uh longer periods of time that's for sure but you know, I don't know if. Oh, that's well, yeah. They they're they're wonderful for that. Yeah. You know, that's that's their primary function is yeah. to is to deal with the effects of overtraining. Yeah. Uh, they help you recover. Yeah. Recover once again. Stress recovery adaptation 
is the cycle. Yep. If stress is inadequate, you don't make progress. You don't ad- you don't adapt. If recovery is inadequate, you don't adapt. Both factors must be there. And the older you get, the easier it is to provide the stress and the harder it is to provide the recovery. And that's just biology. Makes sense. Cool. So then for the listener, just as a simple takeaway here is um, to understand that that's just how it is. And I, you know, in my experience, I don't know if it's a few that you have to kind of listen to your body, you have to see how your body responds, but you do have to know that your weekly volume, um, you know, my, how my program is laid out is it's, it's the same principles as yours, heavy compound lifting. Uh, the split is just a little bit different. You're doing, um, uh, you're doing upper lower work and you're doing a, a bit extra upper each week. Um, it, because most guys, for instance, are like the number one complaint is not enough chest. Their chest is too small and chest right. is a chest is a bitch. I mean, it just, you know, if you don't, yeah, you know, it's just, you know, if, if aesthetics are your deal, you're going to have to bench twice a week. Yeah. You have to bench twice a week. Exactly. Now, so that's what, of, that's what I have. And it's just the, working that, working that weekly volume to make sure that you're not like how, and just for the listeners and how bigger, leaner, stronger is laid out that weekly volume you should be fine with, but don't get overzealous and trying to like, I'll get people that write me like, Hey, I'm doing two of these workouts a week. Do you think that's a good idea? No, it's not a good idea to do 25 heavy sets, you know, 80, 85% of one rep, max, one rep max per week. Not a good idea. Now it's hard to recover from that unless you're taking a bunch of drugs. Exactly. Uh, now, if you, you're going to take a bunch of drugs, and everybody's going to respond a little bit differently to that. See what you can recover from. Just like if you're not taking a bunch of drugs. Right. There is a point in your training where you have to push the envelope to find out where the edges of it are. Yeah. And that is... That is something that pretty much everybody that's committed to their training does anyway. But just be aware of the reality of the fact that there is an edge to the envelope. Yeah. You know, you, you, if, if you mash on it too hard, you're going to get hurt. And injuries set you back. Yeah, injuries suck. Injuries that's are the number games. one. Avoid injuries. That's keep Avoid your, injuries. Go keep, right up to the point where yeah. you're going to make an injury and then don't do it. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and that, and practically speaking, that means like, okay, you're going to go for that heavy pull and you're, you're creeping up and then you feel your, you know, you feel your back starts rounding. You feel things are not, you know, where they need to be. Put the weight down. Don't try to show off and, you know, do something stupid. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's not how you get, getting injured is not how you get stronger. (laughs) Not getting injured is not getting injured. But still pushing the envelope. So yes. Get yes. And this is a good segue into my next question here, which uh, relates to heavy lifting um, because uh, many people, guys, you know, I've even had guys in their 30s worry about this, uh, but maybe more so in the 40s and beyond are kind of scared of certain exercises, um, especially when we're talking about heavy weight, like, you know, bench press, deadlift, squat, military press, the most important exercises, really, because um, they're afraid that, you know, if they try to try to push any sort of weight, even if they work up to it, you know, they think they're going to get hurt. What's your take well, on this? What are your alternatives to the major exercises? You lay, you know, uh, machines and, uh, and you, and which you can't train. Yeah. You can't train the non-major exercises. Here's the, this is, and I think you and I talked about this in our original conversation. What's the difference between training and exercise? Right. Training is, training is a process by which, you can affect change in the physical capacity of a system over time. It is the process that, it, that you design to produce changes in physical capacity over time. So yeah, marathon training is improve. different than strength training, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, how do you make long-term progress on the leg extension machine? You max out you stack don't. one day and hurt your knees. Right. The, the fact is you don't. Yeah. Right. How do you make long-term progress on the pec deck? <laughs> and the answer is you don't. You cannot make long-term progress. You, in other words, you cannot train isolated muscle groups because they won't train. You can exercise them. Yeah. You can, you can work them real hard, but you can't train them. Yeah. But you can make progress on the main movements. That you and I both advocate, the deadlift, the squat, 
the press, the bench press. You can make progress on those movements for years, years yeah. at a time. Therefore, those are the ones that the program must be based on. Now, if you want to use some of the machines for assistance exercises sure. and, I, and all that, I don't do it anymore, and I don't even program it. But I understand that a lot of people do, and I understand that a lot of people like doing that. Yeah. A lot of people have gotten some stuff out of it. I think there's probably, I think it's probably for the vast majority of people, giant waste of time. Yeah. But let's assume that there's a reason to do uh, I would say, I mean, squats and then some other legs. Okay, the stuff you're going to use for other legs is not going to be trainable in the absence of training the squat. Hmm. Now, what about safety, though? Because that's more that's the concern that I run into. Well, is they they think I, that that squatting, you know, is 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 unsafe because that you know, know, because I, the guy's forty five or something. You know, I don't know, I don't know what you do about that. I mean. Uh, well, what's your? If a guy doesn't understand that squats are safe, then maybe his coach hadn't showed him that squats are safe. Yeah, or what about Squat, the common squatting thing? down and standing back up? Inherently, is safe. Yeah, I mean, we use the toilet, <laughs> but what if the, we're the adding... movement pattern itself, Mike, is is perfectly safe, and all we're doing is loading it. And that's now, where people have a misconception. They think that because they're adding 200 pounds in their back, all of a sudden now their knees are going to blow out. Right, which is hilarious because we don't all of a sudden add 200 pounds, do we? Sure. Well, I mean, even working up to it. I mean, that's – I'm not – I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm just saying this is, uh, this is what no, I, I know you do. Know. Here's yeah. <laughs> but, but my take on it would be that uh, any trainee that doesn't understand that that these movement patterns are perfectly safe has not been educated about it. Mm. And that's the coach's job, right? The coach's job is to make them understand, make a new client understand. No, I'm not going to hurt you. I do these movements myself. I do them with all my other clients. Nobody's hurt. There's nothing at, there's nothing unsafe about it. Squats don't hurt your knees because squats are a hips exercise. Yep. Squats don't hurt your back. Because your back gets strong when you're squatting. That's why we squat. Yep. No, it's not an unsafe movement. Now, if you do something wrong and your form is incorrect, then, yeah, you can get hurt. But my job as your coach is to keep that from happening. Yes. And that's and the key there is that these proper the form. Technique yeah. is the key to not getting hurt. Yes. And you even know, on the bench A lot of people have, press, have squatted 800 without getting hurt. And we're not going to take a personal training client. We're, you know, you get a guy up to, you know, these guys that are paying you by the month to train them. They, hell, they're happy with 405, 505. Yeah. And, you know, you, you don't get hurt doing weights that are that light. You know, you just, you're not, you know, by the time you get to the point where the weight on the bar is more important than your ability to do the workout that day, you're a competitive lifter. Mm -hmm. When you put yourself in a competitive frame of mind with any athletic endeavor, then winning becomes the primary concern and safety becomes secondary. Yes. And that's what happens when you're a competitor. You know, if you're a competitive tennis player, the same thing is true. You're not concerned about getting hurt. You're concerned about winning. Yeah. This is what it means to compete. When when we train people for fitness, we're not we're not doing it in a competitive in Sense. a competitive yeah. way. Our emphasis always must be on technical correct, uh, technically correct execution of these movements. If the movements technically correct, then the potential for injury is very, 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 very low. Yeah. It's not zero. Yeah, it's just that I talk not, about that. It's not book. ever zero, but no. it's very, 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 very low. Yeah. When Weightlifting the, is just not a it's not a very dangerous activity no, when done correctly. It's not a dangerous activity because the stress is distributed in these major exercises we advocated, the stress is distributed over a whole bunch of different joints. Yeah. This is uh this is completely different than a leg extension, isn't it? Where all of the stress is just on the knee. Yeah. And not just the knee, but the anterior knee. Hmm. You know, that's that is dangerous. 
Squatting is not. And if a guy doesn't understand that, then he hadn't had it explained to him correctly by his coach. That's his coach's job. Now, when the lifter, when the trainee, when your personal training client decides he wants to be a lifter, he wants to be a competitive lifter, then things are different. Yes. From that point on, when he enters the meet, then the emphasis is now different because he's decided that he wants to do a total in front of the judges at the meet, and he either wants to beat his personal record that he set himself under similar conditions, or he wants to beat somebody else. Yeah. When you want to beat somebody, the emphasis is now not on safety. It's on winning. But for, for clients, what we do for clients is we show them the correct way. We teach them why it's correct. We yeah. explain to them that which they need to know. And teach you, patience that it takes time to, to, to build strength. It's, I mean, you teach, teach them about training. Training's a process. Yeah, yeah we're going to squat every day you train for a long time because that's what works. Now, if you're, not, if you're not up for the boredom or if making progress bores you, then perhaps you're not cut out for this. Not everybody needs to be training. Some people need to do CrossFit. Yeah. Or just exercise, go you know, a new workout. Exercise. Yeah, do something, new... eat an IDX, do something different every day. Yeah, move just your body. Burn some calories, wiggle around, you know. <laughs> it's get hot, sweaty, and tired, whatever yeah. you want to do. But when, you, when you've when graduated to the idea that a process must be invested in in order to achieve a goal, then you're training. And you, the coach, direct that activity. And if you don't know how to do it, then you're not a coach, you're just a trainer. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and just to a last point on this safety thing is, for instance, so we talk about the squat, the bench press, right? Because the, 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 the line out there is that bench pressing is bad for your shoulders or military pressing is bad for your shoulders. And again, just so the listener understands, regardless of, and, and this is regardless of age, right? And this is like you have, it's not that bench pressing is only for 20-year-olds. And then even with proper form, all of a sudden, you know, if you're 40 and you're starting working out that you can't bench press, you're going to blow your shoulders out. You know what I mean? Because that, that, that's a definite, that's an area that people are, are concerned about, at least that, you know, I, I hear about that the shoulders in particular um, and if you keep your form in, uh, and you, you don't flare your elbows out, you don't roll them, you don't do all the stupid things that people do and, and you use the weight that you can, that you can handle. Would you agree, Mark, that, you know, it, there it's, it's just, just like any other movements. It's a safe movement. It's not. Yeah. I mean, the, the way we describe the bench press in our, in, in basic barbell training is, is a safe way to bench press. Yeah. I would, I would add that. If you are doing both the bench press as a lift and the press as a lift, mm-hmm. and we recommend for our strength trainees, uh, strength training emphasis people, not competitive power lifters, obviously, but we yeah. we recommend that that a one to one emphasis bench press to press be observed. Yeah. Under those circumstances, no, you're not going to have any trouble with your shoulders. People that have trouble with their shoulders were competitive power lifters with an anterior emphasis on the bench press. Because of so much long pressure. Of time. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I don't, we don't we don't see shoulder problems with people that that do one to one bench and press. Yeah, and, and and the pulling probably helps too, right? Because you, so you don't get your posture all messed up and so your back muscles do what they're supposed to do and right. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a reason we've carefully chosen the the five basic exercises that we use. Yeah, and we, there's a very good reason why we teach them precisely the way they're taught. And uh, I mean, we we believe it or not, we thought about this really hard. <laughs> and what we what we've arrived at is a way for people who are interested in general strength and conditioning to perform these exercises at their optimum efficiency for long-term progress. And that's, you know, that's, it works. It yeah. works. Yeah. It, and it's sustainable for, for your entire sustainable life. Sustainable for the great, decades. Yeah. Decades. The, the great thing about it. Um, so do you think that uh, any sort of special measures should be taken to preserve joint health as you get older? Like maybe things well, like, you know, that reduce inflammation, uh, you know, fish oil, uh, spirulina. Oh, I think you probably glucosamine. should take fish oil. And glucosamine chondroitin work for probably half of the people that take them. I've, yeah. I, I've seen different 
different numbers on that. And that's what the research shows that it's. Kind yeah, of, I, I think some people are able to absorb that molecule and transport it, uh, and other people are not. I don't know why. I uh, don't know if it's digestive environment, transport environment, receptor side environment. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, everything I've seen shows that uh, glucosamine chondroitin work for a percentage of the population, and they don't work for me. Mm. And uh, like MSM, I, I I don't know anybody that works for, but it, you know there may be somebody to claim they get an effect out of that. There's all kind of these supplements that yeah. The, the vast majority of supplements are uh, a waste of money. Are a waste of money. Yeah. Best I can tell. They're a waste of money. I think everybody needs to be taking some fish oil. Not yeah. a bunch, but a little bit of fish oil. Everybody probably should take uh, anywhere from a half gram to a gram of vitamin C every day. Yeah. I think uh, vitamin occasionally D. A, a strong multiple vitamin is useful every three or four days. Uh, I think. Creatine is probably a good idea for most people. Yep. Uh, probably I, the only Jordan proven. Feigenbaum, our nutrition guy, has recently convinced me that BCAAs are a real good idea uh, after you train. But I don't, I, I just, I think a lot of people spend a lot of unnecessary money on supplements. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I think training and enough calories to recover, uh, quality of sleep, all of these things are, are, very, very anabolic. Mm-hmm. And uh, any other things for joint health? Like, do you find, for instance, like I, I like when I'm squatting, not not knee wraps, but I like knee, knee sleeves. Yeah, yeah sleeves. I was, that's what I was going to recommend. That yeah. a lot of a lot of people, especially if they've been training a long time, can benefit from either a knee sleeve or a light wrap that just provides a little compression around the joint. I'm yeah. not talking about power lifting tight five meter knee wraps right that act as an exoskeleton I, but a little bit of compression uh and, and it, keeps, so it keeps the joint warm like it keeps the joint warm it just holds the tendons in place it just makes it so that you can squat without pain yeah uh if your knees are bothering you first step to do is a sleeve if they continue to bother you the first the second step would be to put on a light wrap mm. this of course assumes correct technique right this assumes correct technique because the number one cause of knee pain when you squat is front squatting your squats right the 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 squat properly performed is a hips movement it won't bother the knees at all now if you've been squatting for years and your knees are chronically inflamed and that happens with a lot of people then or from you know, like just, a bunch of running, just, I've run into that. People yeah, like, God know. Almighty, running is much worse problem for knees than squatting is. Oh, yeah. God Almighty, yes. You know, lots of. But once you start getting a tendonitis accumulated in a joint, it's it's real difficult to control. Yeah, it really, really is. And uh, you can take all the anti-inflammatories you want, but changes have started to take place in the connective tissue, and it's just real bad. So. The thing to pay attention to is technique. Stay out of your knees when you squat. Put it on your hips yeah. where the stress belongs. Put it on your back where the stress belongs. Yeah. Stay out of your knees and you won't have any knee trouble. And uh, I found that some mobility and type work can help too. I don't know if you found that, but like um oh, I haven't found that, no, but I know it's very, very popular. And I know people are not going to pay any attention to me when I say that, but I no, I, I don't. I think stretching is highly overrated and a giant waste of time. In fact, I just had an article uh, appear in uh, uh, at our friends at PJMedia.com about this: the the three best ways to waste time in the gym. Mm. And way number one is to, you know, do thirty minutes of stretching before you. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not talking train? about that. I'm actually yeah. not, a, not a fan of stretching either. Uh, I mean, yeah, more I like I've I've gotten uh, help in my own. Like my VMO is very, very tight in my right leg, and it would mess my knee sometimes. But like doing foam rolling, and it's not, it doesn't feel good. But in yeah, in, I don't know. I've got my problems with foam rolling. Oh yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I can explain uh, my problem with foam rolling here in just a second. But the the second way to waste a bunch of time in the gym is with excessive warm up. Mm-hmm. If you're doing 20 minutes on the rower before you yeah, what's the squat, point? 
you're doing two minutes of warm up and 18 minutes of conditioning, and we're here to train. We're not here to do conditioning. Yeah, you're wasting and energy. You're wasting energy and you're wasting time. Yeah. And the third way to waste time is to come in and do the same weight every time you come in. Mm-hmm. It's just you're not making progress when you do that. Yep. Now, I am a big believer in the effectiveness of active release therapy. Uh, I have had it done myself. I know too many people who have, in the hands of a competent therapist, released, say, an IT band. Yeah. And uh, knee mechanics were immediately improved and pain went away. Mm -hmm. There are lots and lots of examples of this. Uh, Shoulder flexibility is much, much more quickly and positively affected by an active release type massage than it is for all the stretching in the world. Yes. People are... uh, much more effectively uh, increasing their their flexibility in their shoulders with the hands of a good therapist. Yeah. But here's the problem with foam rolling, as I see it. Uh, if you do not have an element of sheer force mm-hmm. being applied to the tissues by the hands of the therapist, then you're not going to break anything loose. In other words, active release therapy is predicated on the idea of applying a shear force with the hands through the skin into the connective tissues that actively stretches and breaks loose adhesions, that sort of thing. Moves things in relation to the underlying tissues. You understand what I mean by that? I hope I'm expressing myself clearly. Mm -hmm. Foam rolling is compressive only. Yeah. It, It feels like the same thing, but it's not. Hmm. It feels like the same type of pain. Yeah, you're, there's the mashing component, but it completely eliminates the shear component. And as a result, it just mechanically doesn't do the same thing yeah. as, an, as an active release treatment does. I've found that. I actually see a massage therapist that she worked on uh, Olympic rowers for many years and then worked on cyclists. So she understands uh, anatomy, understands also – it's not a feel-good massage necessarily. She right, kind of right. just beats the shit out of me. But uh, I definitely get more out of that than anything I can do on myself. But I have noticed using – you know, like if you uh, – a lacrosse ball or certain mm-hmm. muscles that were able that I was able to apply enough force to with a foam roller, like especially on my quads and stuff. Where I mean, maybe they were just so tight that that was just the way it was. Well, it could be. You know, a lot of people report a lot of positive stuff with foam rolling. I just haven't found it to be. I found it to be uh, kind of a trendy deal, and yeah. I, my my natural tendency is to not be trendy. But it's it's. Uh, yeah, it, it just, I don't see the, the reasoning there. Now, by the same token, I've got theracanes laying all over the place. I get little spasms in my back, yeah. and direct compressive therapy on a, on, a, on a muscle spasm does, in fact, break the thing up. Uh, when I think of foam rolling on the legs, I tend to think of, the, of, of, of people trying to do an active release type of therapy on themselves and the mechanics are completely different. So I, you know, I, but these things are, you know, yeah, these are, there are gray areas here, but that's just my impression of foam rolling is if you can't figure out a way to, to, to stretch the tissues and shear. Yeah. You know, I found even barbell, you know, using a barbell in the gym on, uh, on my quads even helped. Didn't feel good, but I was, mm-hmm. a, I was able to put enough force on it where I could. Well, if you, you know, you might have been able with a barbell to produce a little shear. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I have a tendency to, to, uh, yeah, I'm with you on it. I mean, it is all that a... stuff is just kind of a trendy waste of time, you know. Yeah. And it's cool to bring in your bands in the gym and look like right. you're all professional and. <laughs> oh, yeah. All these flossing rubber bands and all this <laughs> other shit. And, you know, and that. That very, very fashionable tape everybody smears all over themselves. The placebo tape. The placebo tape. And that is really neat because you get to shave. <laughs> it gives you a reason to need to shave. And that's very trendy as well. And I, of course, don't shave. <laughs> it, it would take too long. 
I've never tried the placebo tape. Never had a reason to. I'm just not going to. You know, some things are distasteful. I haven't ever, uh, you know, I, I don't play the lottery either. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just, you know, ideologically opposed to it. So. <laughs> um, all right. So now what are, you talked about a little bit that, about this already, but what are some of the strategies that middle-aged people can use to make sure they don't overtrain or get hurt? So we talked about reducing weekly volume or making sure that weekly volume isn't too high. But have you have you come across any other uh, tips like maybe some sort of periodization where they're not going heavy, heavy every week necessarily or more frequent deloading or something like that? Well, I think that people that have been training a long time have got to use some variation in their loading cycles. Yeah. That's just obvious. That's, you know, an advanced trainee, yep. uh, no matter how old or young he is, will not respond to linear loading patterns. You know, you can't go up five pounds every time yeah. beyond a certain point. At yeah. that point, you have to start cycling your loading. That's just duh, yeah. you know. So, yeah, I mean, if you know, but if you've got a 68-year-old novice, no. Yeah, or I even let's say, a, let's say a novice in his 40s. A novice in his 40s, it's not called for. Just do the novice loading until it doesn't work anymore. Right. When it quits working, then we'll worry about getting complicated. But until... Complex is necessary. Simple is more logical. Yeah. It's more efficient. Yeah. And if somebody is running into some issues, then, I mean, I guess those are two obvious things they could do is there could be a more frequent deload. I, I mean, I don't see any reason why that would hurt. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't see any reason for anybody to deload unless there's a reason to deload. I don't. Oh, I mean, I find probably after eight to ten weeks of, and I also do some real heavy, like some powerlifting type. I work in, you know, some really heavy and some middle and a little bit of higher rep stuff. But um, I found in my body and working with a lot of people, not that, I mean, you've worked with a lot more people. So I'm just, that's an interesting point because I found that a lot of people, somewhere around the eight to ten week mark, if they're, you know, every week hitting those heavy compound lifts, uh, a lot of people start to feel, maybe not so much in the novice, but more in the intermediate after they have some experience under their belt. Um, they they start getting the, the overreaching, overtraining type of feelings, you know, like kind of fatigued in the gym and not able. Everything feels really heavy. Sleep gets a little bit messed up. And then they, you know, a week deload, come back fresh, ready to go. Well, the, the first uh, indications I have of that with – uh, people that I'm involved in training, the, the first things we examine before we start talking about altering training is, are you sleeping enough? Mm. Are you eating enough calories? Usually they're not doing enough of either one. Mm. Usually they're under eating. Mm. Uh, either Proteins being undersupplied, they're trying to operate at a caloric deficit. That's the first thing you do. Yeah. Rule that out. Yeah. Rule that out. And Make sometimes sure that's that, necessary. And here's another, here's another thing about this, that the most common novice mistake is not resting long enough between sets. Yes. Because if you're only west resting two minutes between your work sets of squats, guess what? You're not going to make all of the reps of your last set. Yep. So, you know, the you, first thing you have to do is, do is rule out the most common novice mistakes, under sleeping, under eating, and under resting between sets. Once those things have been accounted for and we are still having problems, then it may nece be necessary to do a reset. Yeah. But the far more common are the three most egregious novice mistakes. Yes, and that's now once yeah. that's all been sorted out. Yeah, it may be necessary to to reset, do a deload, or you know move on to more uh, complicated programming like intermediate programming. Go, yeah. go to a, a four day a week split, something like that. But until that's absolutely necessary, and that involves a, a correct analysis of what's taking place every day in the gym then don't monkey around with programming that we know works for a very long period of time yeah. under optimal circumstances. You have to make sure the circumstances are optimal. Yeah. And then when, you know, and if it turns out that, yeah, it's necessary to change things up, then change them up. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, for instance, in a calorie deficit, if a person, if, if they need to, if they're starting out at a, you know, high body fat percentage, that's what they need to do. Then, you know, they just got to, 
that are, be aware that that's going to affect their ability to recover, and that might mean that they need to. Uh, they might not, they're just not going to be able to go as long with before they have to dial it back. Just give their mm-hmm. their their system a a rest. You know, I I'm a big fan of eating more. Yeah, you that know? we've we've I'm, talked about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of eating more. I think that your training builds muscle mass. You know, yeah. Uh, fat can be dealt with later. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, eat. at that point, though, I mean, it, you're gonna no matter how fit you are, you're gonna it's gonna be different, as you know. When you're in a deficit, it's not the same. No, like, no. Your, your if training you're in a, doesn't if have to suck. You're in a caloric deficit for whatever reason. The first thing you have to dial back once again volume, yeah. is volume. Yeah. That's the first thing that must go. Just like you're it's like artificial age. Yeah. I mean it's just it's your body your body your body's like artificial ability. Artificial age. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Um, what are your thoughts on you know, upper ceilings of, of weight in terms of We've kind of talked about this a little in the last one, but how it relates to age. Are there any numbers? And I think I know your answer on this, but I've been asked it, so I'm going to ask you it. Are there certain numbers where you would say, well, someone, you know, some a guy in his 40s or 50s or whatever, uh, here's a, here's something to shoot for, but if you start going beyond these numbers and you're pulling and you're squatting and you're pressing, you – you know, you might be. It might not be a good idea. It might increase risk of injury. No, there's not any way to give specific quantitative numbers for that. It 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 so thoroughly varies on the individual. Some yeah. people are freaks. Yeah. You know, some people are freaks. <laughs> Stan Effery. He's a freak. You know, guy's amazing physical specimen. He's an older guy, big, strong. Even he watches his volume. Hmm. Uh, every once in a while, some untrained fifty-year-old guy walks in the gym, becomes a freak. Yeah, you know he's just got that that type of physical potential. He's got the genetics. He's got the ability to display those genetics effectively because of his ability to manage his lifestyle and his training, and he turns into a freak. Most commonly, if you've waited past the age of thirty. To start your training, you're not going to be anywhere close to the potential that you would have shown had you started when you were 19. Hmm. And, you know, I, I guess this is obvious to me to the point where I don't even know why we have to talk about it, but it's a popular topic. Yeah. How strong can I get? I, know. I don't know. I know. Let's see. Yeah. You know, how strong, how much time and resources and attention are you willing to devote to it yeah and what's that your body what, what are your genetics like you said what are your genetics i see i, I see some of these guys in the gym i've seen this where skinny little guys uh i've seen it a couple times where i it was actually just confusing this skinny dude uh was pressing uh bench pressing 315 for reps like it was nothing and he probably weighed 160 pounds i was just like mm. what, what am i even witnessing how is that even <laughs> like yeah. well i mean anytime you start to wonder about the amazing nature of uh, of human potential and the you-can't-tell-by-looking phenomenon. Just yeah. remember Mike McDonald from back in the late 70s. Mm, yeah. Mike McDonald, Mitch 600 at 198. That's insane. With, with a 15-inch arm. Yeah, that's... Hey, you just, you know, it's you can't tell by looking. Yeah. yeah I've had my ass completely handed to me on several occasions by guys that didn't look like they could do it. <laughs> you can't tell by looking. So it's just a, you know, it's it, 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 I don't know how strong you can get. Uh, let's find out. And that's, that's, that's the, the point is that, that even that's all there is to it. Find yeah. out. And the I age, don't know. you don't have let's to worry so out. much, right? How but, do you make it possible to get as close as you can to your, your physical potential? Well, you completely rearrange your life to facilitate adaptation. To the extent you're able to do that, you will express the greatest percentage of your genotypic potential. But there are so many other variables that we don't call it genetic potential anymore because it's just that's just one aspect of the yeah. one aspect of the ability to express that. 
you uh, it's it's far more than genetic potential. There are so many other factors at play. We just call it physical potential, right? Because you 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 cannot, you know, at any given time, uh, really, that what would constitute the perfect example of the ability to to express an individual's genetic potential, uh, physical potential. Well, you'd have to get him when he was nine, <laughs> and you'd have to you'd have to teach him the things you needed him to know, and you'd have to carefully watch what he was doing. And then by the time he gets into about Tanner stage four, when he's 13, 14, then you start loading him. And you take advantage of the fact that every month his testosterone levels are a little bit higher, uh, higher level than they were the previous month. His loading goes up. You offer him absolute perfect nutrition, absolute perfect rest environment. Yeah. No other physical distractions for the other than the thing that you're trying to train him to do. And under those circumstances, you would probably approach a high percentage of his genetic quote unquote potential because you managed all of the environmental effects that govern the phenotypic expression of the genotype. Right. Now, Take a guy that's 50. Think about that. (laughs) Compare the two circumstances, and you'll see the problem. Yeah. You know, I guess the takeaway on that, though, for the guy that's 50 is don't despair. You can still despair. I mean, push yourself. You can, you know. The takeaway is what are you going to do? Nothing? Yeah. (laughs) And that that you can train hard, and as long as you're smart and you keep your form in and you don't do anything stupid. Absolutely. You don't, you know, you don't have to limit because basically what, you know, what, what I'll, what I'll come across sometimes some guys think that, you know, even if they're building up strength, they shouldn't go, they shouldn't, you know, my so-and-so, my doctor told me that I shouldn't ever bench press more than 185 pounds or I'm going to hurt my shoulder. Like that's a rather arbitrary distinction. Exactly. But... No, that's not true. <laughs> Build up the strength. No, that's, not, that's absolute stupidity. Yes. Uh, it's absolutely silly. Look, I've been doing this for 37 years, and I can't tell you how much you can safely bench. Your doctor, who doesn't know anything about either you or the bench press, decided on 185. What the hell? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, you know, I, God, I don't know. Yeah. So, very that's, strange. Yeah, exactly. It is strange. But I just wanted, to, you know, listeners to know that the point is you can train. The training experience isn't so much different, but you know what the weight that you're going to be able to eventually push, pull, and press is. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be in squat. It's not the same if you're starting later than when you're starting younger. But you still you can still go in the gym and and be uh, and put in put in work. You don't have to be afraid that you know right. uh, I better not I better not squat more than this number because I'm going to hurt myself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wait. Yeah, great. Okay, awesome. Well, those were those were the main points that I wanted to cover. Is there cool. anything, anything else you uh, think the listeners should know about the, the what we've talked about? Oh, I, I think probably the thing to remember about the general topic of uh, older people training yeah. is that a you have to train. Your option is not training, and then there you are. You know, yeah. you don't and get strong. Body, yeah. you, you don't. You don't get anything accomplished. B, if you hurt when you're training and you're old, you're going to hurt anyway. <laughs> you know, what would you rather do? Hurt and be strong, or hurt and be weak? <laughs> you know, pain is just part of getting old. It's just grow up. That's just all there is to it. Right. And C, the variable you have to manage, and you have to take the most. Uh, trouble with is volume. Don't try to do too much. Don't for a minute think that you're 20 again. You're yeah. not. Yeah. One of the biggest problems we see with older guys that were former athletes that start back training is, is the last experience they had with training was training in an 18 year old body. Yeah. You can't do that anymore. Yeah. You have to listen to your coach. Your coach knows more about this than you do. 
he's had more recent experience training people in your demographic. Right. And since you're older and you can afford it, point four, get a coach. Hmm. Ask somebody that knows more about this than you do to help you with it. It'll it'll pay enormous dividends. Yeah. May seem expensive at first, but it's not as expensive as surgery. Right. So uh, find a competent coach. Starting strength coaches can be found at startingstrength.org. Yeah, startingstrength.org. We are a growing network of competent coaches. I assure you that anyone holding the certification starting strength coach is competent to help you. Yeah, and that's also then that kind of segue. So that's where people can find you and find your work. And of course, find me at startingstrength.com. Find a coach at startingstrength.org. Okay, cool. Perfect. Starting Strength Coaches Association website is startingstrength.org. Great. And then, of course, I mean, people are going to know I recommend Starting Strength among some of your other works as well. So, But uh, the book, Starting Strength, of course, you can just buy wherever you buy books. Amazon or on startingstrength.com. Yep. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks a lot for taking the time, Mark. I'm really glad. Sure, Mike. Yeah, Anytime. We, glad we were able to do this, um, and I look forward to the next one. Okay. Talk to you soon. Cool.